Welcome back for another virtual shadowing session with Pre-Health Shadowing. Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-led, woman-led, minority-led nonprofit organization focused on creating flexible and accessible opportunities for pre-health students worldwide. We do have closed captioning available um, to accommodate students of all abilities and needs. If you have any ideas about how we can make pre-health shadowing more accessible, please email us at info at prehealthshadowing.com. Additionally, um, if you want to be on our email list and never miss a session, um, you can join uh, with the link that is dropped in the chat. And this is also accessible on our website, www.prehealthshadowing.com. If you want to stay in the loop with all of the virtual shadowing sessions, we do have social media that um, keeps you up to date. You can sign up for our email list and follow us at Prehealth Shadowing on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Since we are open to students all over the world, um, I'm currently calling from California. I would love to hear where you are all calling from. Feel free to drop it in the chat. Awesome, it looks like you got folks from all over. Well, if anybody here is interested in being a part of the Pre-Health Shadowing team, we have a plethora of opportunities for you. You could become a Pre-Health Shadowing student volunteer or a Pre-Health Shadowing leadership team member. The difference between these two roles are um, student volunteers um, are less committed wise um, and have less requirements for maintaining volunteer status and team members play a more integral role in maintaining the organization, um, gain crucial leadership experience for um, future programs and get to connect with professionals and other students. If you're interested, I encourage you to send in your application for the leadership team as we are currently recruiting right now. And if you're interested in becoming a volunteer, all you have to do is sign up. If we have any high schoolers here today, we do have opportunities for you as well. We have our HTP high school training program, um, which offers leadership and healthcare education for pre-college learners. So if you are interested in helping pre-health shadowing establish club chapters in various high schools around the US, I encourage you to sign up for our HTP team. If anyone's looking to get published, we do have a blog where we feature student articles, reflections, review, and success stories. Check out the link in the chat for more information, and you can submit it at prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. Last but not least, um, we do ask if you can donate, please do. Prehealth Shadowing is a student-led, student-based organization. And for this reason, we run solely off the donations and time of our volunteers. We humbly appreciate any contributions you can make today. If you're financially unable to um, make any contributions, we do encourage you to send this link to a family member or a community member who will support your education. Um, and the education of students all over. Throughout the session today, I encourage you to type your questions in the chat. Our co-hosts will ask the questions during the Q&A portion of today's virtual shadowing session during the second portion of today's shadowing session. I encourage everyone to take very good notes because there will be a post shadowing assessment. This will be a free quiz that is available after the virtual shadowing session today. And this will allow you to verify your virtual shadowing hours with a certificate from pre-health shadowing. If you can, and this is accessible to you, I encourage you to turn your cameras on. Um, it's always so much better talking to faces rather than little boxes on the screen. Um, so please, if you're able to, um, I encourage you to turn your camera on and give us a little wave. At this time, I would like to welcome to you our professional today. We are honored to host Dr. Hamlar, who is going to be presenting with Free Health Shadowing. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. 
The floor is yours, Dr. Hamler. Yes. Okay, perfect. You know, I'm trying to gather. My name is Dave Hamler. I'm a uh, assistant professor at University of Minnesota. I'm looking out my window. I have two inches of snow. I saw Wisconsin on the screen somewhere, so they can relate. Uh, some of the other places may not have snow, may not even have cold weather, but uh, we're still loving it here. Um, I don't know if I know anyone else on the call, but I, I admire you for what you're doing. I'm trying to put my admissions committee hat on because I'm on admissions at University of Minnesota and wonder how this would translate to the actual shadowing that goes on. So that's you're giving me food to buy. But what I'm ready to do, I'm going to present my specialty, which is ear, nose, and throat, known as otolaryngology. Otolaryngology is um, a base specialty, and there's several specialties you can do outside of it. My specialty is called skull base surgery. So I know everything between the forehead and the tip of the nose. So right through this area is my specialty. So you'll find a lot of areas in uh, medicine that you'll do the base and then you'll find some passion for some aspect of it later. And that's usually a number of years later. Uh, I remember I was joking with my wife. I went back to school and I'll explain all that. In a minute. And 14 years later, I was back to practice. So you're in it for the long haul. And uh, I think you'll love it. So the definition of my career is all day surgery. So what got me here? I was a dentist in training and decided while I was in training, I was probably going to go back to medical school, only because I knew there was more I wanted to know. Dentistry was fun. I practiced it for five years. Actually got all this education paid for because I joined the military and they paid for my school. And you do feel an obligation. Well, they know you have an obligation to pay them back. So that was a time versus money thing. But what I'll do is kind of go through the basics of being so when I started out, obviously undergrad, I went to Tufts University from undergrad, ended up at Howard University, which is an HBCU in DC, and I did my dental school there. After that, I paid back to government for my time. And lo and behold, I found myself back in medical school. And to pay for that, I joined the military again. So after all of that, uh, with a major in, in, um, in biology, by the way, you don't need to do science as a major anymore. Do what you love to do and as a uh, putting my admissions committee hat on. I think as long as you do well in what you do, take the prereqs. What were some of my ex extracurriculars during undergrad? I played sports. I was a sports guy. So I played uh, football, ran indoor track, and played baseball. Didn't, let, didn't give a lot of time for studying, but the way I do it, the way I realize it is that there's quality time versus uh, quantity time. And you'll find ways to work that. I think um, didn't do a lot of research, research when I came through. And I, I'm not going to date myself because I came through med school and none of you, you, know, you guys were born. But the point is, research was not as tantamount as it is now. I think in four or five years, if you don't do a research project, it's probably going to be uh, in the lower end of uh, acceptance. Shadowing is the big thing now. A lot of people know it as scribing, so that you actually get paid while you're shadowing. There's nothing better than that. Internships are nice because you can get money for those as well. How did I choose this path? Like I said, I was in dentistry. I wanted to stay in the head and neck area. So I had to be intentional about getting into ENT. ENT or otolaryngology is a fairly... Um, rigorous path to go. Right now, it's one of the higher programs to match. It probably wasn't when I came through. But at the same time, if you're going to go into a subspecialty like dermatology, neurosurgery, um, ENT, you have to be intentional about your uh, plans. And you have to figure that out. Then. I have some interesting cases to show you. I'm just going to show you bread and butter ENT in a few minutes and some photos with that. I'd hope to show you some, uh, some of my residents and maybe share with you, but they're unavailable. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen and uh, kind of give you a uh, uh, ENT model. So hopefully you can see this. Yep, looks good. 
Nina, can you see it? Great. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I have to switch my camera to my other screen so I'm not looking off in the distance. You guys can actually think I'm paying attention. So ear, nose, and throat, that's what we're known as, otolaryngology. So we'll talk about the ear first. So what about the ears that is fascinating and important? One is there's the anatomy. Anatomy doesn't change much. If you have aberrancies, that's fine. But there's basic things that you label. And the reason we label things is so that when we're in discussions or if we're in research or whatever, if we mention tympanic membrane, everybody knows what it is. You know. And, but in the days of yore, and again, I'll date myself, people love to put their own names on things. And if you put the name like Collie's ligament, it's great if you knew Collie and what he was talking about. If you just put the ligament from the, um, uh, from the uh, labrum to the uh, shoulder, then that tells everybody what it is. But anyway, you have labels. Now, what can happen in an ear? You can get things down in it. And here's something that you really don't like in your ear. There's a bug down there and, you know, kind of drives people, you know, a little batty because you have this thing ringing in there and there's ways to get it out. So that, that's a basic thing. When I do my um, humanitarian trips abroad, it's more common. If, if it happens here in the state, it's very, very rare. What else? Well, the same thing. It just tells you how to get it. You can put some oil down in there or something like that. So these are interesting cases. They happen and you take care of it. You can get foreign bodies down there. Here's, um, I would say it's more of a uh, fake stone. It's not actually a, <laughs> a diamond or somebody really wanted to get that thing out of there. But these aren't urgent things. It's just things you can get out of there. You can get infections. One of the biggest infections you get is called otitis externa. So otitis, anytime you have itis on something, it's inflammation. Externa tells you external to the ear. So it's, it's inflammation of the external auditory canal. You get bacteria that you know can be associated. With. You can get fungus that's associated. With. Really, you can't do um, by mouth antibiotics. You'd rather want to get the antibiotics right to the source. Why not just put some ear drops in there? And sometimes that canal gets real tight, so you put what we call a wick in there to keep it open. And there's medication to get it down. Some of the features are. You know, common organisms, staph aureus, and I, I know in your world you've seen that. You get a lot of water down there, and it lays in there. It's a nice broth for infection. So those are the kind of things that don't happen. What do you do? You want to clean it. When we say toiletry, not the toilet. You want to keep things clean, but it's what we do. We just put either just put old saline in, water, something. Just to keep. Now, it does hurt. So you probably end up prescribing some pain medication. And these are just other things. The one on the left is a fungus, and this is just inflammation on the right. Malignant otitis externa. Now, you can get an outside ear infection, and it can really go south in a hurry. Meaning, if you're a diabetic and you have a poor immune system, then this can get infected, and it can cause a facial nerve palsy. The nerve that comes closest to that is the seventh nerve. That's the one that makes you smile. Um, gives you some wrinkles when you age, but that's the one you want to make sure is not compromised. So you just can't do topical antibiotics. You're going to need IV antibiotics. And we have a, 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 a methodology where we can increase the amount of oxygen in the air. It's a hyperbaric oxygen tank. Now, some of them in the bigger centers, they actually go into a room where the oxygen is increased by two or three atmospheres. And that helps displace the, the bad germs, so to speak. So anyway, the thing is, it's, it's, you, know, you have to always worry about this malignant open. The middle ear, that's what the kids get, ear infections. And if you look at the, um, the uh, photograph top left, it's kind of clear. That's just clear fluid. So is it an infection? Not really. So what you can do is just drain that if, you, if the patient can't hear and there's issues, but it'll go away. Mother nature has a way of rupturing our eardrums and letting fluid express itself. Now, the next two show that there might be a little discoloration and that's infection. So basically with infection, you have staph aureus again, you can have uh, pseudomonas, you can have a lot of things, but now you're looking at antibiotics. 
It can be acute, where it looks like this. It could be chronic. If it's chronic, this is that eardrum rupture I talked about. Some of the things that go along with this is you could have dizziness and some other things, but you really want to treat it with antibiotics. Now, you can also get blood coming out. If it's so bad, advanced, now you may have trauma to the skin in the ear canal and you have to have blood being expressed from it. Now, skull base fractures, I'll pass through this real quickly, but I only mentioned it in the realm of ears because some of our best diagnoses are ears. You get, um, well, for the ears, we call it retro, uh, retro oral uh, ecchymosis. But for the uh, eyes, you see that we call it raccoon eye. But essentially, you can have a facial nerve disorder there. That's the most extreme where you have to keep mastoiditis. This is a young kid who probably had regular ear infections till the stuff got infected. Now, I talked about the outer ear the middle ear, and now the inner ear. The inner ear is where when you process sound, it actually takes mechanical energy and turns it into electrical energy. And that's where it goes to the brain. You actually can go to Rocca's um, uh, certain area of the brain, and it now makes sound and distinguishes it into language. And there are some things that can go wrong with that. I talked about dizziness, vertigo. There's some things called Meniere, some other things that talk about uh, uh, some coalition of different signs that you put together. Again, somebody's name is put on it. Unless you memorize the person's name, you may not know it. Oracle is the outside of the ear. You can get cellulitis, chondritis, any wrestlers in the crowd. Because with wrestling, you get these kinds of things. You get hematomas. And when you get hematomas, you need to drain them. And what you do, you just numb them up, stick a needle in, take the blood out. And then you end up with cellulitis. And if you get cellulitis long enough, you get cauliflower here. And that's what our wrestlers do, despite wearing it. So that's sort of what you're trying to avoid. So one of my questions is, and obviously I don't have a way to see your responses, but what's one of the most common bacteria to affect the ear? Probably said it once, but it was written down too. I know I go through the slides pretty quick because I have a lot of slides. Staph aureus. That's a body surface an, um, antigen, a, a bacteria that's all over our body. And, and when the body is susceptible to it, like if you're diabetic or you have a cut in the skin or something like that, you'll get an infection. The nose. The nose is right in the front of your face. Guess what's the number one traumatized? Um, facial structure, the nose, because it's some people's is bigger than others, and you know, it's like a proboscis, and it just takes all the blood. I work with the Minnesota Wild up here, and hockey players, and they never wear a mask that come down and cover their their nose is always that's the truth. So here's the anatomy of the nose. Basically, you have a rich blood supply, and that's why that bleeds all the time. There's this little area here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. It says Kissel box area. There's a watershed area for right in the front of the nose that whenever you get a bloody nose, this thing doesn't bleed. You have some big arteries that come in there, spinal palatine, anterior ethmoidal, but Kissel blocks plexus is the one that really is what it is. Some people have foreign bodies in their nose. This one's a little extreme. Some people take trauma to the nose. That's, that's what I see most of the time. There's an obvious deformity. Want to make sure they don't have what's called a septal hematoma, and that's what this is. If you look in the nose and see something bulging at you, that hematoma is going to do just like it did to the ear. It's going to make the nasal septal cartilage go away, and you're going to have a Bob Hope nose. No one knows who Bob Hope is. I'm just dating myself again. But you got to drain that blood out of there. If you don't drain, drain the blood, you're going to have a piece of nose. And this is normal septum. That's hematoma septum. So normal's on the right, abnormal on the left. Epistaxis. So that's what bloody noses are. Mainly in this anterior area, little area is the same as what is crystal box plexus. Posterior bleeds are more associated with long term tra trauma, something affecting the head and neck. This is Kissel blocks plexus up front. And these posterior bleeds come from the sphenopalatine artery, so a little more involved. 
How do you manage it? A lot of people just pack. You know, you pack it off, stop from bleeding. If you're at home, put some Kleenex in there. In the hospital, we do a little, little bit more. We pack it with gauze. Sometimes we use some medications. Yes. So what's causing nosebleeds? Trauma, winter time. Now we're used to that up here in, in, in Minnesota and we have to do nasal saline or something like that. Packing. So what you don't want to do, well, posterior packing is a little harder. Sometimes we put these balloons down in the lower right. You can put some balloons in the nose. That's pretty uncomfortable for the patient. Complications, severe bleeding. You can get hypoxia, uh, hypercapnia, issues with erosion. You don't want to pack a nose like that. Nothing's happening for this lady. You know, it's just kind of how not to pack a nose. But what's another name for pencil box plexus? Kind of said that a couple of times. I, I usually use foot stompers, but we're not in person. So it's called Little's area. Facial palsy, I'm putting this in just as an aside. Facial palsy is one of the things we don't like to see emergently in ENT. That's usually associated with an ear infection. The facial nerve is right there, but if you think about the ear, you have another nerve that comes in there. It's the, it's the eighth uh, cranial nerve and the ninth cranial nerve. So those are important. But the facial nerve is the one that gives you the palsy. And these are some of the key points. You want to make sure if it's upper motor nerve neuron or lower motor neuron, I'm getting too specific for you here, but there's ways to examine it. Trauma can cause it. Bell's palsy is one of these idiopathic things. When you say idiopathic, no one knows what caused it. It's just our escapism. We don't know, so we call it idiopathic. Some medicines for it, give them some uh, steroids, maybe cyclovir in case it's viral. You want to keep the eye moist because you can see this lady can't close her eye. Seventh nerve uh, injuries in, in kids is usually infectious, infectious, Lyme's disease, or virus is usually the cause. Facial cellulitis can be. The parotid gland is on the side of the face. It can get involved. Facial nerve goes through there. So if you have a parotitis or infection of the gland, that can happen. Signs and symptoms. Of sinusitis. That's another area of concern for us, the sinuses. Sinuses are throughout our head. They're, they're there to lighten our, our head. If our head was solid bone, we'd be walking around like this. So we have these openings in our head to lighten the load. When you get infections, then I'll usually treat with antibiotics. If it gets out of the sinus, it can go up the orbit. And that's what happened here, orbital cellulitis. Antibiotics, there's grades, you can grade how bad they are. But we get CT scans to help us. So you have some type of imaging. This first imaging I showed you. So this is a um, axial CT scan. This is the right and I'm sorry, right and left globe into the eyeballs. And there's an infection in the sinus, and it's actually gotten into the organ. There's pretty significant. So viruses can cause things. Can viruses cause sinusitis? I really didn't say that. I talked about bacteria. Yes, they can. I think the last part is the throat. And uh, I know I went through this pretty fast, but it needs more time for Q&A. Uh, the throat, there's a lot going on with the throat. You got the mouth, you got the nasal vault that's in the back of the throat, the pharynx, so to speak. You have the esophagus in the area. You have your larynx. And you have your trachea, so there's a lot going on. Where does it all start? In the mouth. Bacteria can affect the gums. Uh, you hear things like periodontal disease. This is an advanced periodontal disease called ANUG, acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. Now, actually, antibiotics will clear this up. A little good hygiene, a little toothbrush, get that area might help as well. Oral rinses might be a little tender. Ludwig's angina is a nub and progressing to the floor of the mouth. This is actually could be an airway emergency. If the floor of your mouth swells up, it's going to push the tongue back. If the tongue's sitting back against the posterior pharynx, you can't breathe. So this could be a medical emergency requirement. 
requiring an immediate tracheostomy. We usually do uh, cricothyroidomy, but not tracheostomies in a non-urgent There's an area around the gums and around the teeth called the masticator space. It can extend, extend to the parapharyngeal tissues and give you infection there. If it affects those muscles, you won't be able to open your mouth. That could be an airway. This is pharyngitis. These are tonsils, these things on the side, this is your uvula in the middle. It's all red in there. So I bet anybody could say hey, there's an infection. We need to put them on antibiotics. Number one infection is staph aureus again. Now this is just tonsils. There's nothing red in here. These are big tonsils, but uh, they're normal. These aren't. Now you see a little exudate or drainage on them. This is acute tonsillitis. So ENTs take out a lot of time is to prevent stuff like this. If you have three or four of these things a year, you might want to consider it. So again, this is normal. If you want to treat it, an antibiotic of choice is penicillin or augmentin or something that's going to treat staph for you. Now you can get an abscess back there. Abscesses, they're not going to take away your airway, but you're going to have a muffled voice. Pretty classic. We just drain those in the emergency room and the ED docs call us. Put them on some antibiotics and steroids to help shrink them. This is what a peritonsal abscess looks like. Quincy is just a name that somebody put it. And if we just call it peritonsal abscess, everybody knows. You don't know who Quincy was and you won't know what this thing is. So again, uh, bad to the people who label these things. With you. This is the parapharyngeal space, more than likely. Specifically, what this lateral neck x ray is showing you is the parapharyngeal space or the retro, um, uh, retro uh, pharyngeal space. And it can get enlarged. If this is enlarged, then you won't have an airway. You can see it's a little bit bigger here. And with a, um, it's a notoscope actually looking in, you can see this. That it's in here. So you may have to take this out. What they're actually showing, though, is a fish bone. So people get foreign bodies in their tonsils. And in their Why do this? Some people even swallow their dentures. And that's, it's hard to see on this x-ray, but their denture is down in the throat. Epiglottitis is where the epiglottis swells. Again, could be a medical emergency. In kids, H. influenza is the cause. We used to have to admit these kids to the ICU. Now we can admit them. Or no other Again, it could be an emergency airway. There's a thing called croup. Epiglottitis is bacterial. Croup is viral. Big distinction there. One you can treat with antibiotics, and one you're going to treat with time. And you can see the host of different uh, uh, presentations of it. Is the epiglottis pretty well swollen right here? You have to take my word for it, unless you see a bunch of these you can tell. Here it is here. This is sort of the edge of it here. It's a little normal there. So swollen, normal. Metropharyngeal abscess, talk about it. Angioedema. So there's this whole category of medications that we give patients for high blood pressure. They're called ACE inhibitors. And for some reason, and mostly in African-Americans, they have allergies to these ACE inhibitors. So with that, your tongue will swell up like this. Again, I talked about the tongue falling back. This could be a medical emergency. So you got to give antihistamine, steroids, and you might need a uh, emergency airway. They get airway obstruction, a little strider, wheezing, all these things. So that all leads me to the conclusion. That, hey, so what's the most important emergency you have in ENT? We well, could say it's brain injury, but it's mainly the neural neuro, uh, surgeons involved. But airway, airway, airway. And going back to 1627, which this illustration is from, is talking about doing the emergent tracheotomy to help people breathe. And you hear about these things all the time and, you know, maybe even on TV where you have to get an airway and all this thing. So the point is, that is a true emergency. This is how you do a cricothyroid. They have little kits that you can buy yourself. 
if an airway emergency arises, you may be the person there. All you need to do, you know, you could MacGyver it and take a, I don't even know if they make big pins anymore. Like you take the guts out of the big pin and just stab it through this little membrane that's right in the, you can almost feel where it's real superficial. You just stab it through, then you'll present it to someone, you'll give them an emergent airway and they'll be breathing. So cryptothyrotomy or just emergent airway, just using the big pin. So quinsy is associated with what? Tonsils, pharynx, tongue, or trachea. I think everybody remembers. So, questions. I, I'm to the point. I, I know I flew that through that pretty well, but I wanted to show you what my specialty is like. I'm gonna move the camera back over where I have you guys on here. And if you want to ask me questions about the admissions process. I know that, and I know a poll from the University of Minnesota. If you want to ask me things about my specialty? By the way, ENT, I didn't really break down the specialty. So you have ear, nose, and throat. You have pediatric otolaryngology. You can get subspecialization credentialing for that. You have laryngology, which is an airway, of course. You have head and neck cancer or head and neck um, uh, ENT, which is all head and neck cancer. You have neurotology, which does a lot of work with neurosurgery. And then you have me, the skull based surgeon, who does a lot of things. So, like I said, most um, medical specialties have subspecialties that you can go. usually requires more time to go through school or go through training. And uh, you can spend a lifetime training. Or like I did. So, I'm going to go away from sharing my screen. I'll stop sharing. And Nina, I know I went through that pretty fast, but you know, if people want to ask questions the rest of the way, that's fine. Perfect. Yeah, we got a lot of questions for you, doctor. Um, the first question is from um, Aleka. Um, she asks, how long is the training for ENT? So ENT now, you may hear questions about how it used to be. Don't worry about it. You do a year of general surgery. Now, general surgery could entail you being in the ICU for months at a time, being in uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgery. ENT has taken that aspect over. So we literally put you in a first year internship that's more palatable. So you might do plastic surgery, you might do ENT itself, you might do burn surgery, things that are related to it. So that's one year internship. Then there's four years of ENT from your um, PGY two year up to PGY. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, the next question we have is from a student in the Zoom asking, are there any opportunities to do research as an ENT doctor? Oh yeah, so I'm in, I'm in academia. Now, because I split my career with the military, I did a lot of that when we deploying and everything else my lab went away, but you're expected in an academic institution to produce. That production can be bench top. It can be now what I consider QA, QI projects where you're actually looking at outcomes, or it could be something that's more clinically related with clinical uh, studies. You do outcomes in that, in that way by presenting patients who are on medication A, B. A lot of that's in the cancer. So each of those specialties I talked about, each has um, a NIH-directed uh, core that you can go to and do get R01 grants or something as extensive as that, or just little grants within uh, the uh, academic community where you are. So if I'm at University of Minnesota, there might be someone I can collaborate with from an infectious disease. But yes, there's plenty of opportunities to do research. Very interesting. One of our students asks, what is the most common procedure you do as an ENT skull-based surgeon? So we used to do a lot of open procedures, meaning if there was a uh, tumor like a meningioma of the skull base, which if you took a finger and put it right in front of your ear and took a finger right in your nose, where that crosses, that's where the pituitary gland sits. That's where the meninges from the um, 
posterior cranial fossa meet up with the middle cranial fossa, and you grow a tumor there. You can have pituitary lesions there. We well, used to make big incisions on the face and take these tumors out that way. Now we do it all through the nose, which I'll bring up a point. When you're in medical school, you're learning something that is uh, important in the research that's been established for the way you do it at that time. Since I've left training, I've had to revamp my skill level because everything's changed. So now I take these tumors out through the nose. So it, the point I'm making is you're, you're forever learning. But the most common procedure I do is pituitary surgery, surgery with neurosurgery. Very interesting. And these um, types of surgeries that you do sound to be um, pretty graphic. So Sarah in the chat asks, is there a process um, that people use to get used to the more graphic aspects of being a medical doctor, such as surgery or other invasive procedures? Or do you go into medical school um, with these kinds of procedures already being kind of squeamish around these procedures? Well, two answers. One is you grow yourself into it. You're not doing these procedures day one. You're actually seeing them, doing them, and kind of teaching them after a while. But the point is, is that you grow into it. So your tolerance level for the type of surgery you might be based on, you know, if you can stand it, but also be your skill level. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is, is that, um, you know, it, it, there, there's, there's an old standing reality. We're not going to operate on our relatives. We're not going to operate on my grandma. You know, I'm not going to operate on my grandma. Because you have to have a level of detachment. It's important to take care of your patient, but you can't get caught up in, you know, into the emotion part of it. That what if grandma had a problem and I got a space family and this is my kid. So whatever surgery it is, even though we love our patients, we want to do the best that we can do for them. You have to be detached so that you can make critical decisions that may be life or death. And if you get caught up in the emotions, you're not going to be able to do it. So it's not just seeing blood and being squeamish. It's the fact that you're doing it. And when you have that attack detachment, you can work your way through those other areas. Wow, that's really interesting. Another student in the chat is asking um, if you had a most memorable day um, in your career as a surgeon. Um, we don't do these anymore, but I had a 22 hour surgery where, you know, you just had to keep the adrenaline going because the person, again, level of detachment that we, you know, need to get through the surgery. And there wasn't a possibility of stopping the surgery because of blood, you know, blood loss, the availability of blood, the tumor bed that was there. So you just had to, you know, work your way through it. And it's amazing how your body responds. You know, I always hear this thing, mind over matter, and what it's amazing what you can do if you dedicate yourself to it. So I had an old coach in um, in high school. And everybody be running and everybody's all tired and stuff. And they're complaining. And he said, what, you're complain what are you complaining for? You decide to come out here. It was your decision. I didn't come bring you off the bench and put you out here or take you out of the classroom. So once you've made your bed, you got to lie. In. So you have to be accepting of that role. And that's anything you do. You have to put your best foot forward during that process. Do you recall what the surgery, um, that 22 hour surgery was for? It was a large uh, skull base meningioma. Same thing I talked about before. It uh, started in that area I talked about, but extended to the frontal lobe. So it took out a lot of large vessels that we had to bypass, meaning put, had to hook arteries up while we're doing the process. So the blood flow continued to the brain. So not only are you taking, this, taking the tumor out, but you're reestablishing blood flow that the tumor has compromised so that you don't call the stroke. Wow, that's amazing. Sounds really big. How do you recall the, the outcome of that surgery and how the patient recovered? Yeah, the patient, I, I think they had a minor stroke. 
but it wasn't a major stroke. When, it, when you have a minor stroke, you know, everything's in the eyes of the beholder. A minor stroke where someone may have a little uh, aphasia, like Bruce Willis was diagnosed, uh, that you heard about Bruce Willis today. Um, that's Panama in his career. But the patient's alive, the patient can still communicate, and loved ones can appreciate them being there. Wow, that's incredible. Kind of shifting over a little bit to um, the application um, side of things um, and admissions. Um, when looking at um, applicants, what kind of specific things are you looking for when you interview pre-med students, um, particularly students who are philosophy or psych majors and how can they um, better stand out to medical schools? So you're gonna hear from all med schools, we do what we call a holistic um, approach. So all those metrics that are being established that were established, like what is your impact score, what is your GPA, all of that stuff's going to disappear one day. In medical school right now, long answer to your question. In medical school right now, there's a test called step one. It's very important for where you score as to what specialty you might enter. So on a, on a uh, 600 scale, or I mean, uh, yeah, 600 scale, if you get a, I'm sorry, wrong scale, I'm thinking it's that. On a um, 60 scale, if you get like a 52 or 60, they'll consider you for neurosurgery. If you get like a 30 or something, then you're not going to get it. So what have they done? It's all pass fail now. So step one is pass fail. So how do I, as a person who's reading applications, rate someone? I'm going to move the goalposts. There's a step two, which isn't pass fail. So now I'm going to ask all my applicants to take step two so I can grade them. Pretty soon that'll be pass fail. MCAT's going to be pass fail at some point because what it does, it doesn't measure the worth of you as a physician, it measures your ability to take a test. And we realize that in medical school, but right now all the evidence for our applications are based on these metrics. So it'll go away. And what I meant by that holistic um, uh, application is that we're gonna look what you've done in terms of contributions to society, what you've done in terms of service, to fellow uh, human beings, what you've done in terms of volunteerism. We're gonna take all those things into account. We're just now getting it. So it's gonna change. So I think the MCAT's gonna be passed out. Now what's gonna to happen to your GPA? It's still gonna be there, but I knew I know a lot of um, academic institutions who have pass fail for undergrad. How do you rate that first? It's gonna be community involvement, it's gonna be the things might be research. Remember, I, I joked about research being required. It might be if you were involved in research. And all of the research history is telling me is that you're a lifelong learner, so that you're going to be engaged in what is being presented out there, so that you're going to take up new techniques. You're going to learn, learn new things. Because I told you already, everything I learned at med school kind of went out the window, and I'm I had to relearn everything I'm doing as a uh, physician. So it's going to change through your lifetime. It just depends on how fast. I don't know if I answered the question correctly, but uh, I'm kind of beat around the bush. <laughs> Thank you. Priyanka in the chat asks, what is working in healthcare in the military like? What, in the military? So first of all, it's paid bills. And you have to have the propensity to want to be in the military. Somebody telling you what to do. Somebody telling you to be in harm's way if you have to. And you have to be accepting of that. If you're not accepting of that, you shouldn't go in the military. But what I got out of the military was that I was part of something greater than myself. One of the big things that we look for in someone who's coming into medicine is that it's not all about them. It's about service to others and what you're gonna do for mankind or society. That's that's getting all altruistic, but it's true. So if I have a bloody nose, we talked about bloody noses. Here I am, I'm 66 years old now, so I put it out there. Um, 
And if I go in and take care of a bloody nose, I'll get paid $12. Is that important to me right now? 12 bucks? No. But I am serving someone, and that's why I'll still get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go take care of this patient. So that ought to be the driving force, not how much you're going to get paid, what kind of glamour you're going to have, what kind of lifestyle you're going to have. Everybody's lifestyle is going to be good just because you are going to be in the upper 2 to 4% of, of, at least in America, of what you're going to take home as income. But what you do with it is good. So I think the driving force should be service to others. So in answer to your question about the military, you have to want to do that. And if you don't want to do it, don't get into it. Because you're going to have somebody telling you to do something you don't want to do. And you're going to have issues. Thank you so much. I feel like that's such an interesting point that you made when you talked about, um, you know, when you entered the military, you felt you were part of something bigger than just yourself. And I feel like that's really, that really spoke to me. Kayla in the chat asks, how crucial is it to have research experience on your application? And what are the odds of getting accepted without any research experience? Okay, so I'll, back, I'll go backwards. If you're applying to ENT or one of these um, subspecialties, you better have research, you better have a paper. If you're applying to medical school, it is not required, at least at the University of Minnesota. And I sit on the admissions committee. We do not require research. Now, I will tell you that someone who has some research in their background, they're looked on a little more favorably than those who do not. So it's hard to tell you not to do it, but it's not required. Your, your, your application will still be read if you don't have research. But if you have research, that might put you up a little bit. Ahead. And, and most programs, at least our program is rolling admissions. So when you apply, you meet all the data and the committee votes on you to put you in the class, you're in the class. So we may have all, if we start in August or September or something like that, we may have the class full by December, but we're not going to have it finalized till May because people are going to fall off that. They're going to have better offers somewhere else. They might get full scholarships somewhere. So people fall off. And we just add the people who are rolling, who are in the milieu to the, um, uh, to the class. Key point there, apply as soon as you're able. So if you can get that MCAT out of the way and you're happy with it, apply right away. Some people, they're not happy with their MCAT, so they may wait and take it a second time and then apply after that. Thank you so much. We have a follow-up question regarding the research um, that you just discussed um, in terms of elaborating on what research consists of. Is this, so go ahead. Research, everybody thinks it's bench top research. You know, you got to be in a lab. You're not going to get a paper produced on there. And, and when you do research, we're not looking at you being a uh, being a scholar or, or, or you know being the next um, uh, greatest investigator ever. You know, we're not looking at that. We just want your participation in the program to know that you, you form a hypothesis, that you have aims, you have first aim, second aim, and there's goals you're trying to find out. And you're doing it in a deductive reasoning fashion because that's what the whole diagnosis thing is about. When you have a patient, they're presenting data. You're processing that data. And you're trying to come up with a differential diagnosis and you're trying to help them through it. Research is the same way. You're going to be researching your patient. You're going to be researching the subject. But the point is, it's just given some more substantiation that you're lifelong. So yeah, we'd like you to do it only because your learning methodology is going to help you as a doctor. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we talked about um, medical school and you know majors. You don't necessarily have to be a bio major or a science major. Um, but does where you go for your undergraduate degree affect the medical school application at all? Well, it, it does. And I'll tell you this, if you go to a institution that does not have a medical school, 
meaning you can't go over to the dermatology department or the ENT department and do research in there, you're going to struggle with. You'll have your basic sciences there. You could go to biology, chemistry, and do some research with them. But I think you're, you are at a disservice if you're at an institution that doesn't have a medical school. Because there, you can actually just walk across the street and see what's happening. You can talk to the doctors, residents, medical students. In other words, you're at the water, you're at the water cooler. You're getting that information firsthand. Ones who aren't at a medical school, that I at an institution has a medical school, they better go to the hospitals in the area and sort of align with somebody who's a mentor, a coach, or a sponsor at that hospital so that they can learn the language, they can scribe, they can do those things to learn what it's like to be a physician. So there is a disadvantage. The other disadvantage is, is when you um, are looking to apply and you need letters of recommendation. It's no secret that there's networking involved as well as what you know. So if there's a medical student who may be interested in ENT and they know I'm an ENT doc and they come over and do some work with me, I mean, a pre-med student, then they're talking to me. And if they need a letter of recommendation, I can do it. Now, when you apply, we like three letters of recommendation. One is from a basic science person. That could be chemistry, biology, something like that. Because that's the acumen you're going into. They want to know that you tried your hardest, that sort of thing. And then we want somebody who is in the medical field. That could be the person who you're scribing with or something like that. And finally, we want somebody who knows you. It could be a football coach, a baseball coach. We don't want to be family member. That's pretty biased. But we want someone who knows you well. So they can speak to your personal qualities. So those are the kind of letters I look for. And if you're at an institution that has a medical school, you're automatically going to find somebody who's a physician can speak to those issues that, that talk about medicine, that your career, um, your career trajectory, how they, they envision you being the greatest doctor that ever lived. Thank you. We have another student who's asking about are older students disadvantaged in the admissions process? All that is mythology now. Um, last night I was on a panel. Somebody brought up the fact that they're not a traditional student. There are no traditional students anymore. Everybody's coming in as second careers, having established something else, and they've got um, accountants, we got teachers, we got dentists like I was, you got um, research, you got all, there's no traditional student anymore. And so everybody's a little older. It used to be, you know, you get out of undergrad, you know, you're 21, 22, and they just kept going. Now it's across the board. They're not at a disadvantage. I will tell you, you better demonstrate an energy level. And that may be, may be more important at the residency application because you can get through um, undergrad and uh, your prerequisites in medical school. But if you're up all day and all night and uh, not pulling your weight, your, your resident mates are going to get mad at you more than the staff. So got to have the energy. That's good to hear. We have another person asking how grueling is an ENT residency? Well, having gone through it and survived it, I don't think there's a reason for it. The point is, is that if you're in it and you're in it for the right reasons, it's fun. And I came through in a day when you literally were on call for 36 hours at a time. Those days are gone. But us gray hairs like to talk about it way we used to. So you go into the hospital and you're there for 36 hours. You go home, you're eight hours, and then you're back out for 36 hours because you just lived in the hospital. Now there are rules about that. You can't stay in the hospital more than 24 hours. We have to let you out. And that's all about well-being and you being successful and you having the ability to be resilient. Because one of the biggest things we're seeing right now is burnout from all our physicians, not just neurosurgeons, but everybody. Because you can work yourself to death because we're dedicated to our field. We have this thing called the electronic medical record. 
just before I got on to you, it was, it's uh, 7.30, my, actually 8.30 my time, but 7.30 before he jumped on, I'm up here seeing patient records. I'm dictating. So you could work all day and all night. So well-being and resiliency is a big part of this now. Along the lines of that, we have a question about ENT and work-life balance, but I also think just general tips for work-life balance would be useful. ENT is, well, put it this way, it used to be called easy nights in ten offices. So, you know, it, it was one of those that was everybody wanted to do. It's like dermatology now. You literally could have daytime hours only. It depends on what subspecialty you want to go into. And I like to be busy, so I chose one of the more rigorous ones, so I can make it as rigorous as I want to. But ENT is one where you can actually see patients in the clinic and just stay in the clinic all day. If you choose to operate, you can operate. You can do larger cases, smaller cases. You can do facial plastic surgery and just do cosmetic surgery. So there's numerous and all brain, all different types of fields are like that. But ENT is as grueling as you want to be. It's a wonderful field. Um, right now, if I look at the transition over the last 12 years, we're majority female now. It's like 60-40. So moms can come to work when they want to. Dads who want to be with their kids and they're there with their kids, they can come to work when they want to. So it has a wonderful uh, work-life balance. Very interesting. We have another student asking how you decided to go the ENT and the medical school route. So I told you I was a dentist first. So mine was kind of predestined. But when I got into medical school and started doing rotations, you know, I loved OB. There was nothing more enjoyable than bringing a life into the world. I mean, just think about it. It is truly amazing. And I was just captivated. And OB is the same way. You have a basic specialty, but you can do infertility. You can do just OB. You can do um, a spectrum of different specialties. Again, that's, that's one of the commonplace things of all our specialties. But because I was head and neck and I was, you know, I was destined there, that's why I went into ENT. Uh, when I was coming through, the ear, nose, and throat physicians were starting to do a lot of the cancer surgery. And the cancer surgery was done by general surgeons who specialized in head and neck. Some of you may have heard of the Memorial Sloan Kettering. It's a, it's a hospital in New York that had subspecialties, and general surgeons went there to learn head and neck. And when I was coming through, that was starting to transition to ENT. And the head and neck guy told me, do ENT. And this is a great guy, a guy named um, um, Dr. James. And he was a great surgeon. But he told me, you can shorten your training period probably about by four years if you just do. So he gave me great advice. And that's what you should look for. You should look for mentors along the way. You can rely on to give you that advice. Do you think there's anything you can do either as an undergrad or a high schooler that can help you decide what you want to do in terms yeah. of later in life? Shout yeah. out. Just follow people, do different disciplines. But when you start medical school and you go through your rotations, you're going to love everything. It's just fascinating. I mean, I'm not an internal medicine doc, and I did it for one, a couple of reasons. One is I like to get to the answers faster than looking at 100 differential diagnoses. If something has uh, 100 different possibilities, I don't want to be, be limit mine to five. If there's five possibilities, I can take care of one. I, I don't have time for 100 different things. Some guy gave us a lecture, 100 reasons for chest pain. Time out. I, I, I can't go there. So your personality will probably lead you where you want. Very interesting. Someone's asking, if you need a post back to boost your GPA, would a medical school prefer you get some kind of master's in a science or go to a nursing school to help with future medical school applications? 
I was talking to someone, and, we, and it wasn't this, 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 this crowd. But what we like to see is that if you've been away from science for a while, do a post back, see some, you know, see some trends, some grades that help us solidify that you're ready for med school because you're going to be drinking from the proverbial fire hose your first year. It's all those sciences are going to be thrown at you. you want to make sure you'll be successful. So if you've been away from it, please do a post back. You don't need to get a degree. Now, it doesn't hurt to have a, a master's in public health or something like that. That's going to boost everything. I mean, it's going to say this person has dedicated a life to public health. That's number one, but also demonstrated they're in it for the long haul. So I would say if you want to get the degree, fine, but usually we just want to see that you are uh, able to uh, be facile with the uh, sciences, especially that first year. It's good to keep in mind. Jade says, I've heard a lot of scary things about how debilitating the path to neurosurgery is. I was wondering if it's actually that bad or just a lot of dedication and hard work. Dedication. I know you're not in neurosurgery, so. Dedication and hard work. I mean, I work with them all the time. I work with their residents all the time. That's the longest residency you can have. I mean, there's a lot of bright people now. There's some smart folks in there. But the point is, is that is a lot of work. Now, they do live in the hospital. Any, any, if you're at a level one trauma center and somebody gets a head bonk, guess what? Somebody's got to rule out, you know, some type of head trauma. And a neurosurgeon sitting there waiting. So a lot of trauma teams have, have helped divest from neurosurgery to do that. And that's the big level of trauma centers. But the point is, is that it is an investment in time. But it's worth it because you're talking about high value real estate. That's what it is, neurosurgery. You, you're off a millimeter to one side. You, you've got some issues. I don't know if I could be a neurosurgeon, but I praise them for all the work they do. Do you have any tips for working with difficult patients or patients who just don't want to listen to the advice you give? So that's, that's the whole point of, of where I started. It's great to be worthy in the sciences and everything, but you have to work with people. That's why psychologists do well in our field. That's why people, people persons do well in our field. Because you can be the smartest person in the world, and if you prescribe a medication and the patient doesn't take the medication, so what? You haven't accomplished anything. So you have to become, you know, dedicated to that patient where they trust you. You have to gain their trust, that they believe what you say is going to help them. So you can say all this stuff and you can use magical terms and language they don't know. And they'll go home and say, what did they tell me? You know, they have no clue. You don't have any buy-in from the patient. So the thing is, if it, and, and, and I'm sorry to say, our time with patients is getting less and less. I have 10 minutes allotted to deal with a patient. So even when I'm talking about this, when can I do that? One is you walk in and you engage the patient. It's not, it's not an ailment you're engaged in. You talk to the patient. You find out what their problem is. Let them put it in their terms. If you interpret that and you give maybe a, a little more scientific language that maybe you just say, I, I know a little bit about this. And then you talk to them about alternatives. And when you talk alternatives, you're not forcing something down their throat, literally. You're letting them help decide what's the way they want to go. And if there's a couple of them and they're equivocal, Go with what the patient wants to do. Go with what they're willing to go with. So, you know, there's, you, you, have, you have a responsibility to explain and help the patient through this. It's not my way or my way. And, and gr gradually you'll find that out, if not day one. But you'll find it out. And, and there's ways that your credentialing services and your hospital will find too. Your patients aren't very compliant. They're not doing as well as the other patients. You have time to adjust your style. Very interesting. We have a student asking, after learning so much and studying different fields for so long, do you have any strategies that help you study better, like mind mapping, flashcards, or do you find reading and building an, an interest helps you? 
So, you know, I remember running to the library, looking stuff up. If anything's published in a book nowadays, it's ancient history. So forget the library, forget that stuff. Now, if you have to go there, being quiet kind of fun. So most, if you look at most specialties, everything's web-based. And you get the latest information on belonging to organizations that have web-based um, applications that help you study, that help you know what you need to know. And at some point, you're so um, adept at acquiring knowledge because you've done it for so long, you probably just have to read it once and you know what you're doing. So it's not the, and, and I hear this all the time, and I said it earlier, you see one, um, do one, teach one. Now you can just see it, you can go do it. I mean, it, it's basically because you know the anatomy, you know the applications that you need to use, and you have the technology, now you can apply it or not apply it. So I think the way we learn is a little bit different. I'm doing a study with a, a group, and it's talking about mentorship. And what I do, if I'm a mentor for someone, I almost learn as much from my mentee as what I, whatever I'm giving them. Because the mentee probably is a little more sophisticated about the technology and how it acquire knowledge than I am. I try and stay abreast, but things are changing all the time. So the whole point there is group you do better as a group, as a team, you'll hear that come up time and again, teamwork, you gotta be part of a team, than you do solo. So it's not, not so much what I learn on my own, but the team learns and what's imparted in our discussion. How important do you think it is to speak a second language on the medical field? Um, depends on what crowd you're, you're around. So. Some of us are intentional being at, you know, you used to call them um, um, uh, city hospitals or, you know, hospitals that serve the inner city, those kinds of things. There, you're going to have to know it. If you're in the middle of some suburb somewhere where everybody's white and they talk your language, then what the heck? But nowadays, society's changing. You're going to find that if you're fluent in somewhere else, and, and, and not so much just the speaking the language part, but if you speak a different language, you appreciate the different demographic. That's the important part to me, is that you've actually endeared something enough that you've learned the language and you're able to appreciate some difference. You're not just caught up in your world, you, you can actually make a transition to someone else's world. That's the importance of it. I think that's very important as well. Would it be possible to walk us through an average day in your life? So I'm someone who is slowly aging out. I've taught everybody to do what I do. So what I do, I go to different hospitals. So we have residents and they all go to different facilities. And that's basically what I do. I follow my residents or they follow me. So there is a community hospital that I go to for clinic on Monday. And I see patients there all day long. Now that's preceded by a, um, a Zoom now, but it used to be in person, a trauma conference Monday morning. We just look at all the traumas that came in, not only over the weekend, but uh, for the weekend. And we assess them, we do an M&M, &M, it goes the way. So that's Monday, and Monday evening is usually followed by a grand round. Or something. Tuesdays are my admin day at the university. So that's admissions day work. That is a lot of the DEI stuff I do for the medical school in my department. And sometimes I'll sneak a case in surgically once or twice at several different facilities. Wednesday is my university day. That clinic starts at seven. I'll operate after I'm done with clinic anywhere from 10 to two o'clock, have a few meetings, and then Zooms again. Uh, and of course, all these days are filled with medical students and residents who are shadowing, who are with me, um, learning the trades. Thursday is my VA day. I'm at the VA all day. I love working on my uh, veterans. I'm a veteran myself. Um, 
those guys and gals, you know, dedicate their lives, risk their lives. Some of them have really hurt themselves, have been hurt in the process. I love what they do. Friday is my operating day back at that community hospital. So I'm back at the community hospital doing that work there. Dispersed in between there, there are several other hospitals. One is like the, um, the county hospital. Go there for some special cases. I do special reconstruction called free flaps. I go over there. So it's it's a mixed bag. I like it that way. I like the variety. Uh, it keeps my calendar jumping, popping, so to speak. I got to know where I am. And if it's Tuesday, it's this. If it's Wednesday, if that gets all scheduled and. And, and just like here it is, it's uh, 8.41 here in Minnesota, I'm talking to you guys. So, you know, things are always busy. So that's my typical day, whole week. Sounds very busy. Do you think the variety in your schedule helps you avoid burnout? And do you have any tips? I, I actually do, but I think what helps me, I, I started running marathons, so I'm always running. So, so I'm doing something physical to release that. So oh, I like the expenditure of energy and it kind of gets my head right. I'm impressed. I could not run a marathon. We have two students asking about GPAs and applications. Will your application still be considered if the GPA is under a certain number? So I talked about a holistic uh, review. I think a lot of medical schools are being intentional, looking for underrepresented um, uh, demographics. And classically, that's been the ones with the lower GPA because they haven't had access to the education system, um, to the, there's, there's a host of reasons why people don't score equally. On it. So that's not because you're not smart. It's because maybe you don't have, you live in a food desk because you don't have parents who were there. You're out working because you have to hold down a job to help pay. You don't have time to study. I mean, there's a host of things that demographically may be separated. But the point is, is that we've looked at who is successful. Right now, if you look at the look at the, 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 the statistics, you get a 500 on your MCAT. You're doing just as well as that 517, 520. You're going to finish. People get 500s, finish med school. Simple as that. So all this case stuff where you got to have a 515, 512, that's hogwash. We just say that because we want U.S. News World Report to recognize that we're one of the better medical schools and our ratings are higher than somebody else. Get a 500, you'll get to med school. GPA used to be... 3.75. It's like probably 3.5 now, the average GPA. We've had four eights enter University of Minnesota. We've had 490 MCATs come into the University of Minnesota. And guess what? We finished medical school. You don't have to come in medical school being a doctor right away. And if we tell you that, then something's wrong. I think we're here supposed to teach you something, right? You're supposed to learn during the process. You're not a doctor on day one. And, and facilities or organizations or med schools that just take the brightest and the best, then obviously they probably don't teach very well. We have another student asking, what is the lowest GPA that you have seen that was accepted? Uh, it's 398. Interesting. When you were talking about undergraduate schools that had medical schools attached, we have a student asking if you think it's easier to be accepted to affiliated medical school, excuse me, medical schools than if you go to school without one? If it's state, if it's within the state of your residency, yes. They're more inclined to accept you than out of state. In fact, at University of Minnesota, 80, 85% of our students are in state. And I bet Wisconsin is the same way. We have reciprocity with Wisconsin. But I bet in-state schools accept the majority of their students. I tell people, unless you live in Florida, California, or Texas, 
don't even apply there. They're like, now these are the public places. This isn't Stanford, right? Which is like, they'll take all their um, state uh, residents first. So if you're out of state, don't even apply there. Let's that kind of in. I remember my sister's not in med school, but she once wanted to go to undergrad. She went out there and lived just so she could get state residency to go to school there. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. Um, can you speak about medical biases hindering your profession in any way? And how do you go about dismantling these biases? So, you know, that, that's the topic. I was just in DC at an organization called the AAMC. And so they put a lot of work into trying to help at the teaching level. But these things, as I spoke to earlier, are, are all baked in. Because from policing, to the way you're raised, to the, to the things that you have to avoid, to your ability to access certain qualities, and things in life, all that's baked in. And you're gonna be at a disadvantage if you're from an underrepresented neighborhood. You can almost look at it from a, uh, uh, from a, zip code standard. Just like certain zip codes say your quality of life is going to be worse or if you're going to um, have some early death, or child infancy death or something like that. You can just look at them. So we're trying to address that by allowing people in the med school who look like those neighborhoods so they can go back and, and perpetuate a positivity. Because, you know, it, it, it's hard to say that most of us are going to go to our neighborhoods or go back to our communities and practice where we came from. So we need an incentive there. But biases exist. I have bias. Um, you know, that's why committees are, are formed. When you have a um, medical school admissions committee, they have close to 30 people on there. And everybody's going to have their bias. It's just whoever's going to fill those positions has to realize what they are and fight through that. And so there's a lot of education on our part now to try and rid that bias. And as you all start to come through, maybe with less bias, you can still have bias, but not that dangerous bias that prevents people from getting ahead. You're going to keep changing the world. We're trying to educate ourselves for it, but as you come along, you're going to make it that um, change uh, in the two or three fold. So I guess to answer your question is, we all realize we have bias. We're trying to work through that so that we can better outcomes. And that's why the research is important. If you know outcomes are bad in certain communities, you gotta understand why and what you have to do to address it. You need to throw money at it. You need more practitioners there. You need to break down that you need food, um, grocery stores, pharmacies in these places so that people can have access to them, you need better schools. All those things are important. So, and, and being a physician gives you a platform to talk because you're gonna help be held in a little higher regard than other people. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. And you, you need to be, use your platform to better, better that. Are you a listener of any podcast by chance? Do you have any recommendations for us? I try and do it when I run, but I always screw it up some kind of way. I end up just listening. No, I, I figure, you know, I, I, I do listen to some, somebody else in the week, I'm just a listener of them. But those are great, you know, if you have time. Again, in a way of multitasking. It's great to be a teacher. Awesome. And we have in the chat, um, Kazim asks, do you have any book recommendations that um, individuals should read out of pre-meds? So it's not so much just medicine. Um, I'm a Simon Sinek fan. Simon Sinek uh, has a book. He says, why? You want to know why you're doing something? So it gives you a philosophy. 
you're approaching something that's new, why are you doing it? So if you understand the why, then you can better approach whatever you're doing. Because just like I talked about altruism before, I know I'm doing it for a certain reason and I know what path I have to follow. If I don't know the why, for me or for an organization, something like this, then I, I kind of lost. So Simon Sinek has a ton of books. The other, other books I read are all about healthcare and how they're changing and how it's changing. But I, I don't think you should read those because you'll get, you'll get flustered. <laughs> Is that I want you to keep that ideal uh, outlook and, and change the world. It looks like we have a question um, live. Um, Teros, if you'd like to ask your question, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So Dr. Hamler, I have kind of a return to more of the science and medicine stuff. Uh, earlier, you were talking about removing tonsils because of like recurrent tonsillitis, like four times a year. So why is it that like tonsils tend to, you know, like harbor those uh, bacteria that cause those infections? So tonsils are important entities in our body. So if you think about lymphatic tissue, it screens whatever's coming that way. So if you're putting something in your oral pharynx, it's going to screen it and make sure whatever bacteria is there, or virus is there, that you have the ability to combat it. It might be harmful. So it's an antibody-rich area that's going to be making antibodies to antigens that we do. So you need those. If the system gets revved up so much, they're just going to become hypertrophy. As they hypertrophy, as they get bigger, they have these little crypts. It's like a little cup. Bacteria, no, food gets in there first. Bacteria acts on the food. It gets infected. And you always have a subacute infection all the time. You always have a sore throat. You can get infected and have a uh, peritonsal or abscess. But here's something that, that's, that's really weird. So insurance is way in on this, right? You have a patient that's continually infected, and all of a sudden, the insurance company says, you have to document six times you've had an infection before I allow my insurance to pay for this thing. Now, that, that's great if everybody had the same outcome at six infections. So somebody could be worse at one infection versus my point is, is that it'll get large, it can cause problems, and there's some leeway we have from the insurance company. But you get these little stones in there, it causes bad breath. Now it's a quality of life issue, besides being almost uh, airways. So that's where your judgment and what you explain to the patient, that's them decide if they want them to have now. So you tell them that if you get one infection a year, put up with it. If you get six a year, maybe you should consider getting them out. Then you talk about the risk and benefits of having a surgical procedure. So yeah, is, that, is it necessary? Do we yank everybody's tonsils out? No. We let them decide. Great. Thank you for sharing. That Like puts a lot of light on it. Because I actually am a um, strep A carrier. So yeah. So I mean, no a, longer anymore because antibiotics like cleared it up, but yeah. So thank a, you. Strep A will get in your joints and it'll get on your heart valve. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to lesser your, if you want to lessen the amount of strep you carry in your body, get your tonsils out, you'll probably cut it by 70 to 80%. Let's we'll see. Thank you so much for sharing all that, by the way. That'll be 10 bucks to you. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Himmler, we are about to wrap up our session, so I wanted to take this opportunity to ask if you have any final advice for our students joining us today. Well, I, I, you got to be positive. You know, if I look at the number of applicants and the number of people get in, it's one in three. It's not that bad, you know, but you really have to set yourself up for success. And I'm a slow learner. I really don't know if I would have gotten into med school right off without doing the dental thing, but I will give an example. So I told you ENT is real tough to get into. So to hedge my bet and to get into the institution I wanted to go into, I did a year of basic science research at that institution. 
So they got to know me. I was able to publish papers with them and, you know, show them my work ethic. So when I applied to that residency, it wasn't for um, med school, but it was for residency, which was a little more rigorous. They accepted it. They, they said, come on in. So it depends on how bad you want it. I will tell you, you have the rest of your life to practice medicine. You have a few shots to get in. I mean, you can apply as many times as you want. But try and prepare yourself based on whoever's mentoring you, their advice. Try and take that first shot and do what you need to do to prepare for it. And it's not hedging bets or anything else. It's almost guaranteeing you'll get in. Wow. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Hemlock, for your session today and for all of the amazing insight that you've provided to not only myself, but all of the students joining us live today and asynchronously through the Free Health Shadowing website. It's been an absolute honor and privilege. Well, if you ever need me, I, I, I know you have my email. If someone needs to contact me, give me an email or text. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. And for our students joining us today, I do have some information for you. So do stick around. We'll have some info of how to take the quiz, um, the post shadowing assessment that will get you your virtual shadowing. Thank you so much. Um, credit today. So just before we move on, I just wanted to take an opportunity um, for reflection um, as you will be applying to medical school or other healthcare programs. It's important that you take something away from each opportunity and experience that you have. And so here are just some three guiding questions um, to help get the um, you know, questions flowing. And so um, we encourage you to take a moment and really reflect uh, from what you got from today's session. This will help you when you are writing your um, uh, applications for school as well as during interviews. And so I encourage all students to take part in this. Additionally, if you wanted some recognition, uh, you could send us your review or your reflection as well as any articles or success stories to prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions to be featured on the Prehealth Shadowing official website. Again, if you're interested in being a part of the Prehealth Shadowing team, you are more than welcome to sign up. We are currently recruiting for the Prehealth Shadowing leadership team. And so there are applications available on our website. Um, we encourage team members to be able to contribute at least five to eight hours on a weekly basis. And volunteers are able to contribute as many or as few hours as they want with a minimum of about an hour per month. So not too bad. I know that everyone has a crazy schedule, especially being pre-health students. So hopefully this is something that is accessible and all of our opportunities are 100% remote. Again, if you can donate, I do encourage you to do so. There is a link right here to our page for donations. Again, if you're not able to donate, please, please, please send this link to someone who will be able to donate on your behalf. We are currently all volunteering our time to support this program and to provide opportunities for students. Um, and we would greatly appreciate um, any contributions that you can have to help us keep our website up, um, to help us keep our Zoom running and all other costs that go with running a nonprofit. If you missed any part of the session today, don't worry. I will be posting it on YouTube as well as the pre health Shadowing website for review at a later time. And you can always come back to this and watch it if you want to do a quick review before you take the post shadowing assessment, you're totally able to do so. Be sure to catch our sessions. We have them all the time and we have updated sessions up on the website and there will be more to come. Um, you can register early on the pre-health shadowing website and subscribe to the email list to make sure that you never miss a session. If you are interested in taking the post shadowing assessment, you can do so on the pre-health shadowing website. If you find Dr. Hemlar on the home page and you click there, you should be enrolled in the session. Many of you already are if you've made it this far. And once you go there, you can take the 10 question post shadowing assessment. You'll have two tries in 30 minutes to take this assessment. If you pass with a 70% or higher, you are eligible for a certificate that uh, verifies your virtual shadowing hours today. 
Thank you everybody for joining. This is the end of the virtual shadowing session today. The pre-health shadowing team will stick around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions about volunteering or joining the team. Thank you for joining everyone and I hope you have a great day. I'll see you next time.